Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this first session of the Fall 2021 ACLS webinar series, Stations of the Cross, Conveying Narrative Through Gesture by Margaret Adams Parker. My name is Pam Hardiman, and I'm a member of the ACLS webinar committee. We're delighted to be moving to Zoom so that we can see each other and have a more open discussion with our presenter at the end of the presentation. The presentation and discussion will be recorded and available for later viewing by ACLS members on the ACLS website. The presentation alone will be posted on our YouTube channel for you to share with colleagues and clients. We will begin with everyone on mute. At the end, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, just wave your hand or click the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen. Be sure to unmute yourself when you are called on. Our speaker today is Margaret Adams Parker, an ACLS member and member of the board, and a liturgical artist and theological educator at Virginia Theological Seminary. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pam. And thanks as well to all of you who are joining the webinar online. I'm especially grateful to ACLS for the invitation to talk about my stations of the cross. Um, since this presentation has offered me the chance to step back and look at the ways that my stations fit into my larger body of work and help me to see that gesture is the underlying structure in my figurative work. My first set of stations are woodcut prints. They're 24 inches high and they're rendered in stark black and white. The second set are paintings on wood, inset into larger panels that are five foot, five inches high. The images are painted in monochrome against a gold background and they're framed in red with a station number in gold above and an Old Testament text in black below. And you get a good sense for the scale of these works in photos from an exhibition last year at the Bible Museum in the Biedenharn Museum in Monroe, Louisiana, where the woodcuts and paintings were exhibited along with Gibbs Singleton's bronze stations sculptures. And two excerpts from longer YouTube videos allow you to see these stations in close up detail. And I'm afraid you may hear a significant amount of static that seems to originate in the interface between YouTube and Zoom. But the full videos with clear sound are available on my website and also through the links listed below. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Lord Jesus, though you were condemned to death for political expediency, all judgment has been placed in your hands. Grant that we may not make false judgments against our neighbors, but may be forgiven by your great mercy for the sake of your love. Amen. Amen. That was um, from a video uh, produced by the Church of England and distributed in 2019. And this second excerpt is from um, a, a YouTube video created by uh, Virginia Theological Seminary, which is the largest seminary of the Episcopal Church um, with a musical accompaniment written by professor of church music, Marty Barnett, Burnett, using the painted stations. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest with the elders and scribes and the whole council led a consultation and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And they all condemned him and said, he deserves to die. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
Then he handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Let us pray. These are two very different sets of images, the same narrative interpreted in two very different media. And besides working in paint and woodcut, as you've seen, I also etch and draw, and I sculpt in both terracotta and bronze. And I'm sometimes asked, why so many different ways of working? Is there any common thread? And my answer is that these ways of working are like different languages, each with a capacity to tell a story in a different way. You've already seen this in the two sets of woodcuts, uh, two sets of stations. Woodcut is raw and unmodulated. Paintings offer greater subtlety and nuance, as is etching. And sculpture exists in our physical space and has a heft and power of its own, but there is a more basic underlying language, a deep substructure running through all my figurative work, the language of the body that artists call gesture. This is the language I rely on to convey the narrative and pull the viewer into the story. Gesture is simply the artist's term for what is more commonly described as body language. Those who are careful observers of the people around them know that the ways we carry our bodies offer nonverbal physical expressions of our inner lives, of our life stories. I learned this from studying and teaching the art of Rembrandt and from sketching as he did the life around me. So we see in these sketches, the relaxed intimacy of friends sharing conversation and photos on the subway, in contrast with the poise, with the focus of the older woman concentrating on her crossword puzzle. Here we see the poise and energy of the fiddler in a tavern, in contrast with the slumped posture and unfocused gaze of this frail and bedridden patient. Observations just such as these created across a lifetime of sketching, offer me a kind of body knowledge of gesture and its significance that I bring to all my figurative work. So in Reconciliation for Duke Divinity School on the Prodigal Son, we see the father stooped and frail, embracing his prodigal son, whose clothes are in shreds, his face a mask of despair while reaching out to the older brother, a robust figure whose body and mind are turned away from reconciliation. The father's gestures embody the love for both sons expressed at the end of the parable in Luke 15. Son, you are always with me and all that I have, all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The gestures of our sisters, a triptych of woodcuts in a suite of 15 purchased by the Library of Congress, embody the joy, strength, and grief of the title. In this etching, the boy Samuel 
his youthful figure almost lost in the cavernous darkness of the temple, tilts his head as he wakes, puzzled to hear the voice of the Lord. And in this etching of Ezekiel's dry bones, I show the lifeless bones being pulled inexorably upward to stand upright and await the breath of life. In these woodcuts for a new translation of Ruth by Old Testament scholar Ellen Davis, published in Who Are You, My Daughter? Reading Ruth Through Image and Text, we see Naomi's gestures transform her from a disconsolate widow bereft of husband and sons to a woman devising a plan for her daughter-in-law to an honorary mother cradling Ruth's newborn. We move from the intimacy of these small etchings and woodcuts to the physically largest project I've worked on. This is the communion of saints in etched glass for St. Agnes Catholic Church in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And this historic congregation wanted for their newly built sanctuary to integrate the history of their parish and that of the local community with the history of the church and of the biblical witness. So the life-size figures on the over nine foot high glass panels include Agnes Gibson, one of the founders of the parish and St. Elizabeth Seton shown here in conversation across time and space with St. Ignatius of Loyola with the, foot, with the bridge at the foot of the town in the background. And here you can see the panels in their fixed positions, enclosing a day chapel with a door offering an entrance from the narthex. The panels are suspended from the ceiling and can be unlocked, rolled out of the way, and stored in order to open up a, uh, open up a much larger gathering space in the narthex. And in Mary as Prophet, which was winner of the 2016 Faith and Form Honor Award, gesture helps convey a new vis visual interpretation of the visitation. Mary here is tense with the words of the Magnificat, the hungry will be filled with good things and the rich sent away empty. Her hands clenched, her gaze focused inward, she is unaware of the world around her. And Elizabeth, old and worn, reaches out to comfort and protect Mary <clears throat> in her vulnerability. You may also have noticed another lesson <clears throat> that I learned from Rembrandt, who rarely depicted biblical scenes with idealized or heroic figures. Certainly, there is deep and significant theological warrant for picturing Mary as the Queen of Heaven. And there is also justification for Mary seen as one of us. We remember that she describes her state as one of lowliness. So I set these biblical narratives among ordinary folk, in this case, women from Sub-Saharan Africa who are truly among the least of these, our brothers and sisters. Mary has the close cropped hair of a young girl in that society, Elizabeth the gravitas of a wise elder. And it was very moving to have these decisions about my interpretation affirmed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Consecrating the sculpture, he remarked that he sees these same women in refugee camps and other areas of conflict and deprivation that he visits. Now, sculpture is a particularly powerful means to convey these biblical stories. Sculpture exists in our own physical space and often seems to reach out in three dimensions to make manifest through the gestures of the figures their lived experience. My goal when working in two dimensions is to retain that physical, that palpable physicality. And this was particularly important to me in undertaking the Stations of the Cross. 
I chose to depict my first set of Stations of the Cross as woodcut prints, and I should mention that they were published in 2019 in Praying the Stations of the Cross, Finding Hope in a Weary Land, written with systematic theologian Catherine Sonderegger. In creating these stations, I wanted to draw on the raw power of images in black and white only without any color or decorative element that might soften our encounter with Christ's suffering. I wanted to convey, I wanted the images to convey palpably his gradually diminishing energy but also to underscore his strength and compassion, even as he suffered the pain of his Via Dolorosa. It was particularly powerful to see the gestures from the woodcuts echoed by the gestures of worshipers at a Good Friday service, where participants from Spanish and English speaking congregation together walked the way of, of the cross at a sanctuary where the stations are mounted outdoors. The painted stations will be on view next Lent at the Duke Chapel at Duke University. And station one is discussed in a reflection on suffering and First Peter that was just posted on the visual commentary on scripture, an online resource directed by Ben Quash, professor of art and theology at King's College London. In this set, I depict the figures in contemporary dress rendered in monochrome with a gold background making reference to the icon tradition and the ox blood red outer frame evoking the rich colors of medieval art. Old Testament texts printed below call on the medieval typological tradition that links the two testaments. Again, we see Christ's energy diminishing in each of the falls. And there's perhaps a greater tenderness in this set of stations. The muted browns are less stark, and the gestures underscore Christ's intimacy with each person he meets on his way to the cross. Here his mother and Simon of Cyrene. But I also wanted to evoke an, and, uh, the woman wiping the face of Jesus and the women of Jerusalem. And the soldier nailing him to the cross. And I wanted also to evoke Christ's majesty, even when cloaked with suffering. Looking back, I can see that gesture undergirds all of these works. And gesture also helps me to express two themes long important in my work. The first are my laments, which are my response to the suffering in our world. And I, um, I just pulled off the wall in my studio um, two quotes that hang to inspire me. The first by Albert Schweitzer, to think occasionally of the suffering of which you spare the, yourself the sight. And the second by Elie Wiesel, it is so much easier to look away from victims. It is so much easier to avoid such rude interruptions to our work, our dreams, our hopes. So this is an inspiration for my laments. You've already seen an example of this uh, in grief from our sisters, joy, strength, and grief. African Exodus is another instance created in response to news reports of waves of refugees fleeing genocide in Rwanda. I was moved by their courage and imagined two of them, a mother persevering and stalwart and her child, his exhaustion clear in his drooping head and limp arm. His tiny body is held upright only by his mother's supporting hand. A student from South Sudan murmured about these, this image 
yes, it is just like this. And his instinctive response was confirmed by the decision of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to publish this woodcut as the frontispiece to report on refugee children for their refugee survey quarterly. By contrast, these refugees from Sarajevo huddle against the rain and sleet of winter with the last of the group casting a lingering look back on the ruins of her city. I created this etching and then a woodcut from the same drawing, which allows us to see how clear the difference is between these two languages, the nuance of shading possible in an etched image and the clarity and power of the woodcut. American Pieta is a sketch for a sculpture proposed for a Civil War era cemetery for freed and escaped slaves. The mother raises her face to heaven in a gesture of raw and undisguised grief. The father cradles the head of their dead infant, bowing his own head to cloak the intensity of his response. You can see the same diversity of response in seven small studies I propose as a memorial for 272 enslaved men, women, and children sold by Georgetown University in 1838 to keep the university solvent. The individual figures embody the suffering, but also the courage and endurance of these men, women, and children as they face the dissolution of their families and anticipated far more brutal conditions in Louisiana. As a title, I took the words of one woman pregnant and facing childbirth on the journey south, what will become of me? Gesture is also significant in another aspect of my work. This is a call I have felt across many years to include images of African Americans and Africans in my work as well as in my teaching. I've already shown some examples of this in my sculptures and woodcuts. And I seem to have lost page six. Um, this is um, a sculpture based on a sermon, an early sermon by uh, the Reverend Michael Curry, who is now presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And he preached a sermon, an All Saints Day sermon to his congregation, to a woman who had died out of the congregation in uh, and was listed on the parish rolls simply as died, servant woman, 1839. And he said, I have thought about you a lot, servant woman, and I wondered, were you a tough sister or were you a scrawny little thing, were you? And I thought about her too. And here she is, that tough sister, but here she is, perhaps not the tough sister, but an elderly and frail older woman, or perhaps she is a young girl physically threatened by her youth and her lack of power, embracing herself uh, protectively. This prophet Jeremiah, uh, in the, the expression on his face and the lift of his head conveys the power and the energy of the prophet of the Lord. Madonna Angola, based on reports by a friend from internally displaced persons in Angola, is part of a series that um, I hope conveys the dignity um, and courage of these women and men under uh, circumstances that we can hardly begin to imagine. And this six color woodcut, Casualties of Conflict, displaced shows a woman refugeeing with, with her children. And it was very moving to me when a young man who saw this woodcut 
who had refugeed from Vietnam with his mother. And he said to me, I am that boy in the bottom left embracing my mother. I'm also called to increasingly to embed these, um, um, these biblical stories in other cultures and other outside of those that I have depicted before. This de desert nativity depicts, um, and it's a very small folding set of panels, depicts um, the nativity story here in one detail of the left uh, with these golden messengers in this dark sky among the native peoples of the desert Southwest with the, the words from the prologue to John's gospel below. And here are two paintings currently on view in Decolonizing the Christ, a juried exhibition at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The two smaller preparatory paintings are part of the eighth Catholic Arts Biennial at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. The burning bush was inspired by an ancient icon depicting Mary as the burning bush where Moses removes his shoes in the presence of the Christ child shown in Mary's womb surrounded by flames. The text in my painting is an excerpt from an Orthodox Coptic hymn to Mary as the burning bush. The fiery bush that Moses saw was not consumed, so Mary carried the fire of divinity in her womb. The robe of mercy originated in my response to haunting phrases from F. Pratt Green's Holy Week hymn text to mock your, your reign. He's speaking about the soldiers at the time. They did not know as we know now that though we suffer blame, you will your robe of mercy cast around our naked shame. This Christ in a fusion of passion and resurrection imagery is majestic, but bears the shredded garments of passion died suffering and manifest the wounds of his crucifixion. In a gesture of healing described in the hymn, he cast the purple cloak over the viewer, the token of his own humiliation transformed into a sign of love and mercy. On my website, I describe my work in the liturgical arts as creating beauty and meaning for sacred spaces. And I feel that beginning with Desert Nativity and American Diptych, I'm being called to embed that beauty and meaning within an expanded context, helping to enlarge the canon of religious imagery by depicting holy figures as persons from diverse periods cultures and peoples. I now hold the words from Revelation 7-9 in mind as I work from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. But I do not exclude my own time and place. I am particularly honored to be working on a sculpture and site plan for a memorial garden from Micah Ministries, a ministry to the homeless, offered through a consortium of six churches in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And in this commission and in all my endeavors, I will continue to call upon that underlying language of gesture to convey the narrative and draw viewer into these sacred stories. And I, I wanna add that um, I will be making a residency in Navajo land, the Episcopal, the invitation of the Episcopal Bishop of Navajo land, as soon as COVID precautions make that possible, where I will have the chance to be in conversation with the people and to sketch the land, the people, um, their dress, um, with the hope of making further larger works for their sanctuaries. 
I want to end with a few words honoring the long tradition that I'm proud to be a part of and from which I continue to learn. Art in the service of the church stretches from the early centuries of the Christian era to our own day and images that explore the joys and sorrows of the human condition stretch back even further. So to mention only a few, my particular mentors whose incomparable skills of hand and eye were always in service of heart and mind have been Rembrandt and Kata Kolbitz. The great early medieval sculptor Gilbertus and the late medieval sculptor Klaus Sluter have been models for me as has the late German, the late, the 20th century German sculptor Ernst Barlach, who drew on that medieval sensibility to create works in a contemporary idiom. Closer to our own day, the photographs of Roy de Carava show us the luminous beauty in the everyday lives of African Americans, as well as their extraordinary courage. Charles White, great African-American printmaker, likewise offers images of great power. This linoleum cut is four feet tall. And Tyler Ballon is a gifted contemporary painter who is setting the biblical narrative in the inner city. And finally, I wanna thank and mention the Association of Consultants of Liturgical Spaces. Um, the, the ACLS, as you see here, is composed of liturgical consultants, architects, and artists who are interested in helping communities develop inspiring spaces for prayer and communal worship. We welcome new members and please see our website for information. Ooh. I'd like to thank you, Margaret, for um, such a great talk. It, <clears throat> two things struck me. Um, one is that when you're working it, with a position that you have in a university where you're doing art, you're not necessarily quite so bound to doing things for a particular space, um, you know, for a client as we are. And that seems to give you a lot of freedom. It's also um, impressive the, the number of different media that you work in and how well you handle it. Um, Thank you. I, I should mention that I do not work at a university, that uh, Virginia Theological Seminary, unlike say Duke Divinity School, is a freestanding seminary, not as part of the university. And certainly I do have, um, I do have um, freedom um, of creative freedom in my work. Although certainly when I'm working on a commission, I always consider a commission um, a collaboration and in conversation with the commissioning body. And it's, I, I look at it as a creative act that we, we do together, so. Definitely true. Um, I was, I loved the piece that you're you're proposing for Georgetown, and it really made me think of um, what it would mean to have something like that at the university and to acknowledge the past and instead of just covering it up. Um, and, and can I just say that I think that thank you that the, um, the every every institution on the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, has slaves, except probably the, uh, the ones built there are Quaker institutions. Every institution of a certain age, churches, universities, they all have slaves in their, in their past. And some of them, uh, uh, William and Mary has a, um, um, a memorial they had just, um, they've planned, I don't think it's actually completed, a University of Virginia. And what strikes me, is what they do in these, and it, they're very beautiful, is that they, there's a whole list of names. And um, names can be very powerful. 
you know, say their names is what they say in the Black Power movement, the 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 Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but but and they mean a great deal to the people who share those names. But I would I would also argue that say for the casual student walking across a campus, that those names become invisible. But if they were to be if they would have to walk every day between figures that embody the experience of those who were sold to keep those universities or, or put to work to build those universities, I think that they would think differently. They would, they would understand it in a, in a physical and palpable way. Gilbert? I just I love the images. <clears throat> Excuse Thank you. me. I, I love the images. Um, I was wondering in the gestures, especially with the um, the woodcuts, mm -hmm. uh, they're really strong and powerful. And I'm wondering, do you find that people are able to capture a sense on objects that are just viewed for a short period, <clears throat> like a Stations of the Cross, where you're moving from one image to the next to the next? versus one that one might sit in and contemplate for you know, like a half hour. Um, have you noticed any kind of difference between that power of gesture and the length of time one views uh, the art piece? Well, that's a really lovely question. And I, 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 ha I haven't thought about that before. Um, I, I um, Certainly, I, I would say that certainly, even though in the Stations of the Cross, you move through the images, um, when there's a liturgy involved, you do stand and look. Um, I think more often when there's a written liturgy, you know, we all just look at the words. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're just all so literate. Um, but um, I'm hoping that the images will also bear looking at for a longer period of time. And, and maybe some of the people that I that know these images and have stood before them can uh, can speak to that. Thank you. Gail. Oh. Um, I I want to say a few years ago I was visiting a friend who lives in Durham and we went to the Duke Chapel. And I and we were wandering from one building to another and there was this open hallway with outside on either side, just a glass hallway. And I looked in the courtyard and I did a double take. I said, wait a minute, stop. <laughs> I have to look at that. And it was the prodigal son. And oh my goodness, I was, I will say Gilbert that it does cause you to pause and look for a long time because the, the, the it was the gesture. Um, seeing the father trying to be father to both sons at the same time. And I think you really captured what each son uh, stands for and how the father is trying to bridge the two of them and trying to um, be father to both at the same time is really, I mean, I'm taking pictures thinking, how do I get the best angle of this? Because you can't do it all in one picture. It's, it, it's multiple sides and, it, it's really was wonderful. I wanted, I wanted to, to, and I thought, I got to find out who this person is. <laughs> and now I know, I'm so happy. <laughs> oh, that is so moving. I'm really, I'm very touched. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Well, yes, it, it was really wonderful. And now I have to tell my friend about next Lent and go back to the new chapel because you're going to have to see some other things. But um, the other thing I was going to say is you mentioned, <clears throat> you mentioned Rembrandt and Katie Kalvitz, and I, I could see that right away that influence. But I also wonder if you have ever, if you're familiar with an artist by the name of Adi Bethune, no. who worked with um, Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker. Oh, well, and, and Fritz Eichenberg, you know, I had to leave out the people that, you mm -hmm. know, there was a whole list of people I had right. to leave out. So. Right. Take, take a gander, because uh, again, I saw reflections of your work, um, of their work in what you're doing. It's... Oh. Well, you can send me that name because I'm not sure how it's spelled. I will. I will do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I will say one quick word about um, the prodigal son because um, a friend, a Jewish friend, saw this 
the full scale model before it went to the foundry. And, um, and he said, well, what's the story? So I told him the story and I got to the end and he said, well, well, and I said, well, well, what? And he said, well, what happened next? And, you know, that's a question I don't think any, I've never heard anyone who knows the story ask that because we just, we know the story. But in fact, it made me aware that that story is open-ended and we really don't know. And you don't know in that Duke sculpture, we don't know what the ending is. Mm-hmm. And I see that my friend Ellen Davis, who's a, a co- who's at Duke Divinity School, and was was responsible for bringing me down there for that. That um, she was there. She is. <laughs> she was um, part of the committee that worked with me, and I had a small sculpture of a, a little study, not very you know, not very accurate study. And in that study, the older brother was staring at the father and it was kind of confrontational so I said well you know and they all were I said you know it's pretty pretty in your face here so um and and this is just a little plaster model with wire underneath so I said well you know we can change that and I went and changed that they all went "Ah." um but it's so I changed that head so that he's turned away and looks down and and that's really an example of how one little small thing can change the judge gesture and change yeah. how the how that reads. So yeah. anyway, Absolutely. Karen, it looked like you had a question. Oh, in Marilyn. What I was gonna say is to go back to Gilbert and also what we were just talking about is I think the um, Peggy is exactly right in the importance of gesture. And I think the reason is that even at a distance, we can read it. We know what the emotions, what, what's happening through the gesture. And that I think resonates with us on an emotional level, probably not even cognitive, but something deeper. And so I think we're able to enter in emotionally through the gesture, and then we go deeper in in other areas. So I think you're exactly right. And something as small as turning the head, it does make all the difference in the world. But your your work is powerful, Peggy. I really enjoy, have enjoyed this. And to see the, uh, the different media, the same thing in the different media. So two stations of the cross or um, etching and then uh, drawing or woodcut and <clears throat> that, that I'm, I hope that informs committees, uh, design committees, um, on uh, opening their minds to different opportunities and different ways of bringing art into their sacred space. Mm. Thank you, Karen. I mean, it's it's lovely to 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 be able to share this with Karen because. Um, it's it, her work and my work are similar in many, way, many ways, but they're they're different in other ways because her work is very meditative. I think Gilbert, I think it is. It's her work is always overtly an invitation to prayer. I think and contemplation. Mine is more narrative, and it certainly it lends itself to prayer of a different kind. Um, mm-hmm. But we make we're kind of like a little team here. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Marilyn. Okay, I want to um, sort of piggyback on what Gail said because I was at Duke also and just happened to go out on that, I don't know what you call it, the little patio. And I was, it was so engaging to see that uh, prodigal son. Um, you know, I spent some time just walking around it and um, I had never seen one depicted like that. So uh, one of my thoughts was, I wish it was in a more um, public space because if you don't happen to go out there, you might miss it. So, you know, that was, that was one comment, but I, I absolutely loved it. The other comment I have is about um, etching. You don't see very many um, people who are etching in glass. And I think there's lots of possibilities of where that can be used. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, I mean, it could be used in an entryway for people or um, you know, donor names, but that, but it it has lots of possibilities, and I'm fascinated by by the etching. Um, so it's nice to see your work in that. Thank you, and I should mention that the etchings, like the the boy Samuel in the temple, and the um, the refugees from Sarajevo, those are etchings on a metal plate. Here's a metal plate right here. Um, they're on a, a copper plate and they're printed on paper. The etched glass in that sanctuary, and it was designed by Brian Fricke, by the way, who brought me into the project. I did not do the, that etching. It was done by a company, I can't remember, um, but <clears throat> They had some sort of a photo transfer process that would pick up every like fingerprint. And so they took the big drawings that I did and, I, and had scanned and they, I don't know, through some magic, um, uh, transferred them, etched them on the glass. And they didn't, they, they etched it with acid, I think not, there's another way where you can use sand and sandblast it. Um, and that's, that's all I know about etched glass, but I agree with you that it's a, it's a wonderful medium because um, as you see, it, it is a kind of elusive medium. If, if someone in, with a dark robe stands behind it, it looks one way, but if someone with white vestment stands behind it, it looks another. Um, those of you, um, Heidi and, and, and Kate, have uh, actually seen these, these, um, these etched glass panels in um, Shepherdstown and they are, um, so that they are, they're kind of in and out what you see. Um, and, but they also allow this light to come in. So they're not, they're not dark. Um, and there's, there's, I actually have done another etched um, set of etched windows that are inset um, in um, uh, the church at uh, Rock Creek Cemetery, St. Paul's Rock Creek Cemetery in Washington, DC. And those are images. Um, one is Harriet Tubman with her cloak. And she's, she's, she's reminiscent of the Virgin of Mercy with the cloak. Uh, and, but under her cloak are these escaped slaves. And in the other window is uh, Absalom Jones, who was the first um, African-American ordained in the Episcopal Church. So, and those were done from woodcuts, not drawings. Um, and they, I think, were done with a sandblasted medium. So, but it, it allows there to be an image on these doors leading into the sanctuary, but light also comes in. Hey everyone, Grant Ambrose. I'm the rector at St. Andrew's Church in York, Pennsylvania, and I've known Peggy and Kate and Andrew Merrow for quite a few years. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here, and I've had an opportunity to see the uh, the first set of woodcuts at St. Mary's. And so I think Gilbert had the question about you know standing or or looking at it or moving through. For me, it's the continuation of the narrative. Once you start, there they truly are icons in the sense that they you're you're drawn in, and it's like you know I know what the next station is going to be. Oh my goodness, I don't want to go to that, but I, I know I must. And so it's that kind of the cumulative effort for that. Well, one of the thoughts I've had, um, as you were showing some of the other works that you have, Peggy, uh, particularly the, the different approaches or understandings of the biblical narrative, is while that is absolutely something we have to do, on the ground level, it's we have to, in many ways, educate, I'm speaking as a parish priest, educate the congregation as to, one, why it's important, because I think we can no longer assume that everyone knows why it's important. If that were the case, we wouldn't be living with what we're living with surrounded by now. Speaking particularly for York, Pennsylvania, living where one of our school districts has banned 200 books because they speak about racial issues of racism. And you know, we, it's, we don't want to educate people about other races because that would make one particular group feel badly about themselves. It's crazy. They did rescind their vote last night, thank goodness. But so how, how do we, educate the people as to the importance of seeing this and maybe even give directions to how to enter into the art. I think Peggy, you made a beautiful uh, comment about just the names on the, on the wall. Okay, yeah, you can easily walk by that, but when you walk by these representations that, that are looking at you, 
it's more difficult to escape. So I'm, I'm thinking out of this, thinking away, okay, how do I do the groundwork of helping people realize this is something we need to enter into and, and wrestle with? And that, thank you, Grant. That's such an important question. And we are, we are, we, we are embedded in a culture that's often called a visual culture. Um, but, but we're really surrounded by a visual glut. And I've got this wonderful quote from uh, the painter Matisse who says that there this, and he's talking of in, in 1920, he says, we're surrounded every day by this, um, this surfeit of visual images in cinema and poster. And he says that they are to the eye what prejudices are to the mind. And I just think that's so important a statement because we are just surrounded by junk, visual junk. And uh, we need to learn how to discern which ones are important, which ones have power, which ones are dangerous. Um, uh, the, the, there's a biblical it's a, a theologian and uh, of uh, visual images, Robin Jensen, and she talks about that medieval concept of the evil eye. Well, you know, we don't believe in the evil eye. Um, she says, but, but in that, you know, there's something coming at us that's going to make us ill. But there are things that really corrupt, as the prayer book, our prayer book says, and destroy the creatures of God. And I think that there are images that do that. We can all think of those. Um, and, and we are, uh, I, I mean, there's even in the Catholic tradition, which embraces images much more readily than my own tradition. Um, I think they also need to be discriminating. All of us need to learn to be discriminating about the images that we use. Um, Victoria Jones, who's on this call, um, is a blogger. She's got a, she's a, an editor, uh, a religious book editor, but also a very distinguished and very careful and thoughtful blogger, art and theology. And she, um, uh, she and I were roommates uh, at a, a two week, uh, symposium at Calvin College, and and I think she would agree with me that how we have to be very careful with those images, think about them, and think about the the resonance of them. And and I tell my own students who are mostly going to be ordained in the Episcopal Church um, or lay leaders that that we they're 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 images of they're good images, they're powerful images of of Christ. And then there are images which aren't. And, the, and, a, and a bad image, I would argue, is bad theology. And um, so I really in, encourage the larger church and our students to, um, to, in, to bring the same standards to the images they use as they bring to preaching, to teaching, to their prayer, because it's it is, I think it is, um, image, the image matters and it matters in larger society and it matters in the church. So that's my sermon. <laughs> okay, at uh, that point, I think we, we should probably be wrapping up here. Um, this was a great talk, really Thank appreciated you. it. And um, hopefully we'll see many of you next month. Well, thank you. I am so grateful for the chance to do this. I am, as you can tell, very passionate about the subject. And um, it's wonderful to have the support of so many friends, old and new, and um, many things. Thank you.